Hi, and welcome to Chasing Squirrels Podcast. On this episode, I get to talk with Sylvia Duckworth. I first reached out to Sylvia back in March, and just uh, because different projects were going on, and I gotta be honest, I just sort of cold called her, dropped her a Twitter message, and said, Hey, you know, do you want to have a conversation with me on Chasing Podcasts? And, you know, I haven't figured out the method. I don't have a stencil, I don't have this prototypical approach. I have to be honest, most times there's just there's something there's a thing there there's a story that i get curious about that i suspect is a lot broader than the 140 characters so after reaching out to her she was very gracious and said yeah sure and um who are you and i realized i hadn't even provided any context for it so march kind of moves into april and then may we're both pretty busy and i finally at the end of the school year i reached back out and she said sure let's go for this so one of the things about doing this podcast is i've come to deeply respect first and foremost anyone that will share their story but also getting a better understanding that that story comes out in its own time and to formally schedule it when everyone's got a job and everyone's got projects and everyone's got families it just doesn't work so I've learned a lot about patience in doing this podcast and and I think it plays out well because the individuals that I have approached have been able to schedule some time out with me and the stories the stories that I've been able to engage in, I think have just been phenomenal. So without any further blah, 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 here's the conversation with Sylvia Duckworth. And I'd like to wish you an amazing afternoon, Sylvia. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Chris? I'm wonderful. Just uh, hoping you could throw down a, uh, a little introduction for yourself. Okay. My name is Sylvia Duckworth, and I've been known more recently than uh, anything else as a sketch noter. However, I have been teaching for more than 30 years. I've been teaching in the public and independent systems. Most recently, I worked for 20 years at Crescent School, teaching French and technology to grades three to six. And I just retired. So I'm sort of, um, I've got some new adventures ahead. I love it. The sort of common starting point, I like to get out I'd like to get out my guest's origin story. Mm. So uh, I have to admit, I mean, I've lurked your your multi-blog universe, mm-hmm. um, followed your Twitter feed, know of your sketch noting, of course, um, had one or two sort of like parallel conversations with you. And I'll, I'll go, I'm going to give you how you've sort of influenced my life a little bit later on. But I am curious, how did teaching come to you? Uh, okay, we're taking, we're going a long way back, but, um, I actually was, I majored in phys ed at university. I always thought I wanted to be a phys ed teacher, um, cause I, I was a jock growing up and, um, I ended up not getting a phys ed job out of teacher's college, but getting a, te- a job teaching French. And I've been teaching French ever since. And then sort of morphed into technology because that's what my passion has been in the past few years is is technology and so my last year of teaching was a combined French slash technology job but that's how I got started that's um I will say that's definitely something I wouldn't I wouldn't have intuited that yeah I I wouldn't and it's not for any it's not that I it's I believe, totally believe. Um, it's it is interesting where the sort of uh, let's say that the tech or social media exposure goes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's ever come up in a conversation where someone said, "Yeah, you know, I love I love Sylvia Duckworth sketch noting, but did you know she's also amazing at the beep test? Like she could do <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, ten seconds flat. Oh, I did not I did not yeah. know that about you." Yeah, no, I I continue I continue to to try to be active. I used to run marathons. I ran five marathons. I've done a half Ironman. But um, as I get older, I realize that kind of stuff is a lot harder on the body. So now I really just take it easy. I just um, I do slow runs, slow long runs, slow swims, and and I do a lot of walking and a lot of cycling. And that's how I keep in shape now. Nothing too rigorous. 
You know what? I'm going to counter what you said then. I'm going to say once a jock, always a jock then. Yeah. You're probably, definitely. You're probably right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it can't. Uh, and that's the same for me. I mean, I, I have, you know, a few, not extreme sports, but I have things that I like to like to try to do on a regular basis, you know, some snowboarding and some skateboarding. And I agree. Yeah. The, the body disagrees with me the next day. Oh, for and if, sure. And if I have time, I'll share a story about my current suffering, about how it, uh, <laughs> I oh, broke dear. my, sh- I broke my shoulder, oh, no. but, uh, I'll, that this is your story, not mine. But it's the thing about the recovery. It's about the um, at the heart of 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 who you are, sort of, and also a very interesting segue into teaching. Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, I wouldn't have known that about you. It's funny because I only ended up teaching phys ed for one year, and it was only like half time phys ed. So, um, something I wanted initially to do, I never ended up doing, but. I realized in that half year teaching phys ed that I didn't really enjoy teaching phys ed. So it really worked out that I ended up teaching French because I always loved teaching French. That That's interesting because I was going to ask you if there's there's something something in education. You said you, you've also worked in independent schools as well, correct? Yes. So there's that funny thing about – so prior to being a, a teacher, I was, I was a chef, and I always felt like I was very much in control of my career. I could make decisions if I wanted to level up, if I wanted to sort of learn something new, um, you know, with, with the owner's or the boss's permission. I had that mobility to, I guess, do professional development. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's an interesting thing in education that opportunities pop up all over the place. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, though, they get on the waves – and you sort of stop paying attention to them and you look over and they've floated <laughs> quite some quite some distance away and when you said you started with the phys ed i i wondered you made you made me think about was it something that you just kind of you felt like it floated away from you or you felt like you could easily kind of walk away from it um no there were no job opportunities in phys ed so but there were lots of job opportunities in french so french just kind of fell into my lap i was um at university, I only took two courses in French. Um, you know, at the time, that's all you had to do to qualify to teach a subject at Teachers College. And so I took my two courses just to, you know, just in case for Plan B. And that's what ended up happening. I ended up teaching French. That's cool. Did you find that you yeah. you was it was it something hard to fall in love with, or was it you know an easy pairing? You stepped into it. You connected. What was that like for you? Uh, it was tough. I, I, my first year teaching, I still have nightmares about it. I, I, I taught in Regent Park at a school called Lord Dufferin. The kids were really tough. The year before I got there, they went through five different French teachers who just quit on the spot. They couldn't handle the kids. And so I came, you know, fresh out of teacher's college, green as anything, didn't know anything about discipline, had no idea how to, how to deal with these kids. Um, they kind of ate me ate me up and spit me out it was brutal um I think I look back now on on my learning curve the first year and I'm I'm astonished I actually survived the year I think I only survived because I didn't know any better because it's my first year teaching but I ended up um, coaching them in basketball and and softball and that was sort of my I think um that led to them accepting me finally as as a, a viable teacher and so I ended up gaining their trust through sports and managing to the, to the end of the school year. And then I got a job somewhere else. I taught at Ryerson Public School for a number of years after that, which I loved. And then we moved to Montreal. And I taught in the public system of Montreal for a few years. And then when we came back, I started teaching in the independent school system because I couldn't get a job back in the public school system. They just weren't hiring any teachers. So I've been in the independent school system for the past 25 years of my teaching career. Wow. Yeah. Was there was there ever any um with within the independent school was there any trepidation into stepping into that into that frame? Was there was there something in you that wanted to be a part of public education but uh, like say the public education system? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I I was really I mean, I needed a job, so I I took yeah. what was offered me, but I was really sad to leave the public system. I I developed, you know, it's funny, the kids that you teach in um in the in in these low social economic neighborhoods where I was teaching, it takes a while to gain their trust, but when you do, they are so loyal to you. 
And I love teaching them at the end. And then you don't get that kind of student in the independent system. They have mm. so many things in their lives that they take for granted. And, and there's lots of good teachers. And um, I just didn't get, I, I never got that kind of fierce sense of loyalty that I had from, from the kids at Regent Park and in Lord Dufferin. But, um, but I had a great career in the independent system as well. I taught at some amazing schools with great resources. So that's the thing about working in, if you're working in an independent school with lots of resources, you can do so much more with technology, which is what I've been able to do in the past few years because we have those resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's some, the, I I love that, that effect that you described. It is, um, it's blood, sweat, and tears in its truest form, mm-hmm. and I would agree that emotional that that emotional bond that gets built in the classroom, you know, even and it's not. It, it, here's what I've observed: it's not just student to teacher. Let's say it's it it can be quite familial. Mm-hmm. So that 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 sense of family and community is just phenomenal, and um, I could see I could see how that would definitely you would mourn that you would mourn that because that's that's the amazing side of the teacher effect is feeling like you're, you're, you're getting not only deeper into curriculum, but actually to the sweet spot of relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, don't get me wrong. I had that in, in the independent system as well. The, I mean, the students Mm -hmm. were, they were lovely. Um, but they, you know, they, they have so much in their lives. They're not lacking for anything and, and their lives are so full and, and, you know, um, I just didn't get that sense of appreciation that I got from, from the other the other students at the beginning of my career. Oh, I got you. Yeah. I got you. It's, it's, it is difficult to put words to. I, I would struggle to sort of articulate what that thing was. Mm-hmm. And I would also be, I would feel similarly as you as in, how do I speak to that, that relationship? And my current one not, notwithstanding, love what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. But there was something about that connection. Mm-hmm. Who, do, who do you, um, who do you look to uh, as, as a mentor in this path? I love how you, you've introduced this, that credibility factor that it was through the sports that, you know, you, you got the street credit to get Mm. back to the curriculum. Mm. Do you, do you see within your career a similar, I don't know, I guess a similar point of view as in some of the, the people that were touch points for you along the way. Do you have mentors? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Who you got? Uh, Call them out. Okay. So Wendy Maxwell is a French teacher, and she created a method of teaching called the Accelerative Integrative Method. And I, okay. I came across her stuff in the year 2000. And basically, it's teaching French with hand gestures and, um, and plays and stories and songs and um, um, dance. And so... It's, it's an amazing way to teach French, and I visited her when she was teaching in Toronto. I watched her do her thing, and I went, oh, my goodness, I have to start doing this. So then I took up that methodology of teaching right away, and I've been teaching, teaching with it ever since. She's now in Vancouver, mm-hmm. and she's the, um, she runs the AIM Language Learning Company. But uh, she, she was my mentor as, so far as French teaching goes for many, many years, um, but so far as sketch noting goes, I had a couple of mentors when I started two years ago, and one was Karen Bosch. So she's an educator in the states, and she started me off. I had so many questions when I started sketch noting. I wanted to start on the iPad, and so I kept on contacting her. What apps do I use? What stylus do I use? How do you do this? How do you do that? And she was so good with me. And then the other one was Sylvia Talisano who I, I believe she's Argentinian, but I think she's a teacher now in the States. Um, mm-hmm. And I reached out to her, and, and she was great at mentoring me as well. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it's a, you know, that, um, were you able to, okay, so I'm going to put these in two forms. So the mentors that you've just mentioned, um, do you see, when you look at the relationship, between the ones, so the individual with AIM that you got, you got to work side by side with her? Yeah. So the, okay. And then the other two virtually or digitally, did you get to meet them in person as well? I just met Karen for the first time at the most recent ISTE conference in San Antonio. So that was a big moment. We gave each other a big hug. 
It's been two After years. After how long? How long was the relationship years. before you got to meet? Two, two? Two years. Yeah. Two and a half years. And I have not met Sylvia Talisano. I, I hope to meet her. Do you look at those relationships in as far as mentorship goes? Do do you sort of approach them similarly if you're sort of, you know, chasing the 140 characters and then, you know, direct messaging and emailing and Google Hangouts in the same way as you would, you know, someone that you get to spend time with in real life? Is there a common approach between the two? Um, well, I have to say it's a lot more fun in real life. That's for sure. I know. I mean, there's nothing sure. like meet, meeting someone face to face and just chilling with them for a while. I didn't get a chance to do that with Karen, unfortunately. At ISTE, we were both uh, had tons of stuff uh, scheduled. Um, but yeah, that's why you know I tell teachers get on social media. There's so much out there. There's so much learning to do. But there's nothing like going to conferences and meeting teachers face to face. Like nothing meets meets beats that. Um, so, you know, social media is great, but still get out there and make an effort to make teachers face to face. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I have uh, a couple people that started as digital friendships that I've gotten to meet in real time. And much like when you met your colleague at ISTE, mm -hmm. it was quite remarkable. Um, you sort of, you're going from maybe a profile picture, like, Hey, you're you and you're you. And then you go right into the hug and it's, it's, I, I was mentioning to a colleague of mine who started to build her sketchnoting um, skill toolbox. Uh, her name's Pam. I think she's reached out to you a couple times, I think, okay. for some questions, or at least she's, she's definitely followed your, your, uh, your path a bit. But um, she was pretty interested in starting to get on Twitter. And I said, something for you to consider that when you start to use the social media, think of what it's going to be like to meet that person in real life every yeah. single time you post. Yeah. And you're going to have that moment. You're going to have that moment like you did with your colleague and uh, a, a gentleman I got to meet. His name is Roland Chidiak. I got to meet him in real I know life. Roland. <laughs> yeah. And so in, in meeting him, when I met him, finally, I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is really cool. I feel like we've got something here. Let's keep moving this relationship. Let's do some stuff. Oh, yeah. And it was a total icebreaker. Like, there's no awkwardness. You kind of give each other a hug and then you launch into whatever you're both passionate about right off the bat you know already so much about each other so that's why I love going to conferences I'm actually addicted to conferences it's kind of my husband's like okay so you can't really afford to go to all these conferences you have to stop but um, I just love it I just there's nothing in fact when I went to ISTE I don't really attend a lot of sessions like my point of going to ISTE have you been to ISTE before I have not Okay, so you need to go at least once. Um, <laughs> I felt that one coming. I was like, and I and 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 I probably should. It's coming but, to Chicago, you know, next year. It's in Chicago. It's the timing of it, right? It's it's one of those interesting. Oh yeah, you're still teaching, probably. I am to sort of get the leave for it. I can it, and it's sort of. I would have to start building that proposal now. Will. As, it's, as to how I should get the release to well sort of go through that. It. It's such an experience. It's it's kind of overwhelming, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And so I go with the approach that I'm, I'm not going to run myself ragged running from session to session. I'm going to go and just kind of see where the flow takes me. And I'll pop into a session if I feel like it. I'll pop out. But my, my main goal when I go to ISTE, is, I've gone two years now, is to meet people. Is to hang out yeah. at a blogger's cafe and just chat with people. Because that's... That's is there's nothing more rewarding than meeting your PLN after after communicating with them for months. And then taking tons of selfies. That's also big at ISTE. No, I gotcha. Yeah. So I love I love where you've hooked me. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna reverse re reverse go back down the path for a second here because one of the things that I was curious about is that um, participation in conferences. And one of the things that I find I'm, I'm challenged by, and it's usually a part of the proposal when I'm asking for time away from the classroom, is how, how that experience, it's a very technical question, but often it'll be proposed from administration, is how that experience is going to translate back to the school, back, back, you know, back to the students. Yeah. That's just the setup for this. Can, but if, can I just start with a, a wow factor? Like, sure. um, Moscow? Yeah. <laughs> are, are you are, like, like, okay. So, and I get this big smile on my face and I, and I, I know you're at ISTE and I, and I get it. I, I, you know, it's on the, the wish list. And then I'm sort of looking at some other, some other posts. And then I see 
that you're going somewhere in September and I see you're going to Moscow and I, th- I and I wonder to m- <laughs> I wonder to myself okay, um, so, so tell me about yeah, that. I got contacted out of the blue and and I had you know I, I did some research to make sure these people were legitimate and sure they're legitimate and they had a conference last year and I checked it out and I also talked to a couple of teachers who went to the conference last year to make sure <laughs> I'm not going. No, I got you. Absolutely. I don't want to sign my life away and end up, you know, not being able to get home or whatever. So exactly. um, uh, But I followed through with it. I followed up on everything and they're all legit and they want me to come and talk about sketch notes. So I have to say, Chris, that the publication of my book, Sketch Notes for Educators, has given me this whole other level of credibility. Once you're a publisher, you know, people start, you know, thinking, oh, she's an expert. We're going to invite her to this conference. So um, anyone out there who's listening, if this is something you're interested in being invited to conferences, my advice to you is to write a book. You know, it doesn't have to be a long book. It can be a short book. It doesn't even have to be that good a book. But just get it out there. Get something published. You can put next to your name, published author, and people will start contacting you. It's it's the strangest thing. That's remarkable. Thing. Yeah. So tell me about just quickly. Just tell me about the, the, a little bit of that challenging mindset, though, because I've seen, I've seen. Um, here's how. When, whenever I see, I, I here's how I look at your sketch notes. I look at your sketch notes as a collection of experiences mm. that not only are you documenting, so you're you're doing a little bit of a story keeping, yeah, um, uh, approach to it, um, openly shared, which I think is phenomenal. The other part to it, though, is that I I really I really groove on what what kind of compels you or what captures your interest. So the sketch notes in themselves, I look at these are things that are of importance to Sylvia, mm-hmm. and and it sort of gives a little bit of a a little bit of a um, I guess a, a, an ink blot into sure. you know a little bit of your your educational philosophy and the stuff that makes yeah. makes you up. And I know you've you've put a few out there about growth mindset and a little bit about you know change and taking risk. Mm-hmm. What 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 was there a process to sort of saying I am now going to go a, way across the world and do a presentation on something that you are you're clearly skilled in something that makes Mm -hmm. you happy and and you Mm -hmm. as you said you've you've published something on it you've taken that step Mm -hmm. where did risk fall into that because i would just think to myself like i'm i'm in awe i'm in awe of of your courageous step oh yeah no every time i present it's a huge step out of my comfort zone i'm i'm i consider myself an introvert i don't like Mm -hmm. to put myself out there publicly i I'm, I always get nervous before every presentation, before keynotes. I can, you know, I can barely sleep. And, but um, I was talking to this, my fear of uh, public speaking, to Ray Franz Davis. Do you know Ray Franz? Love her. Yeah. So I met her at, there was the Toronto Innovator Academy last fall, and I was mm-hmm. invited to be one of the coaches, and she was one of the coaches as well, and I was telling her about my fear of public speaking, and she said, Sylvia, the best way to get over that is to do an Ignite at ISTE, and I went, okay, mm. I'm going to do that, so then I, I applied to do the Ignite at ISTE, I got accepted, and I pulled it off, so it was five minutes in front of about a thousand teachers, and I'm going to see the next time I do a presentation, if I'm not as nervous, I can mm. always think, oh, yeah, it's because I've already presented in front of a thousand people at ISTE. So we'll see if her, if her advice worked. But, um, yeah, I, I definitely take a risk whenever I go there. It's, it's really I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. But I truly believe that that's what you need to do to get over your fears, is, just go, is to tackle it. And I know that from my own personal experience, but also I know a bit about OCD. I have a daughter who has some pretty serious OCD that comes and goes. And Mm -hmm. uh, if you know anything about CBT, which is cognitive Mm -hmm. behavioral therapy, um, the way to get over anxiety is to approach it. You can't, you can't hide from it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there is a real science behind that type of approach. Someone put it to me with CBT is to reveal the evidence that supports your thinking. Right. And and if there is no evidence, let's find a new way of thinking about this. Right. 
Well, so, so yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You I, go ahead. I was going to say, so CBT, when people say, what is that? The way I explain it is like, say you have fear of spiders. So with CBT, um, the therapist would show you a picture of a spider. And then the next step, so it's, it's um, a scaffolding, right? So from mm-hmm. the next step, from a picture, then you see a video of it. Then the next time you have a session, she might have a, like a dead spider, you know? And then, yep. then the next session would be a live spider, but in a cage. And then the next, so you're gradually at some point, she's going to, you're going to be able to hold the spider in your hand, but it's, it's through uh, exposure. Gotcha. And so the more you're exposed to what you're afraid of, the less you're afraid of it. And that's how I approach public speaking. Have is that something um is risk taking something that cuz I get I here's the thing I I love spaces in my life where two ideas though in conflict mm-hmm. are both true. <laughs> mm-hmm. So and to have that kind of dissonance in your head you can really find yourself at interesting crossroads. So mm-hmm. love doing um sort of like these ignite talks but Mm -hmm. not but and at the same time having a fear of sort of presenting in front of people oh yeah has has that sense of risk that balance of risk to you is was that something that's always been a part of let's say you or you as a teacher or is there was there a turning point where you thought you know what i'm just i'm gonna start going for these things oh no no i i've always had a growth mindset um and you know one of my favorite sketch notes is how to maintain a passion for teaching. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, and I don't, I can't look for it right now, but, but something that I really truly believe in is to maintain a passion for teaching. I've been teaching for a long time, so I ha- I can speak with some authority on this, um, is to have that growth mindset and to try new things because there's, there's nothing worse. There's nothing that drives me more crazy than meeting a teacher. And there's lots of them out there who've been teaching the same way year after year after year after year. Because A, they must be bored silly, and B, their students must be bored silly. Because what they're teaching, if they taught the same way they taught even two years ago, it's not even relevant today. Like It's it's true. That can be true. That that growth mindset, you need that um, to remain relevant in your student size and also to maintain your passion for teaching because that's what's so exciting is trying new things every day, trying, trying new things. And, and you know, you're going to fail. That's the thing with, with trying new things is you're not going to achieve success, but if you don't try new things, you're going to become a very bored and a very boring teacher. I completely agree. I think that's, um, that's a little bit where my, undiagnosed adult ADHD comes in handy. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a bunch of different interests and I've stopped saying to myself, you can do that tomorrow. Right it, Now, of course, there's an organizational framework that I still have to exist in to keep my job, support my family, support my commuters, these elements too. So it's not entirely off the hook, mm-hmm. but I've come to accept that when I notice something, it's not as random it's not as random as as I as it may seem from the outside and as what I might cap it with. Yeah. It's probably my curiosity saying, you know what? Switch up gears. Try a different task. Have you thought about doing it this way? But it's kind of couched in, you know, that whole distractibility. Yeah. <laughs> what the day- daydreaming. But I've come to, I guess, more and more come, started to believe a little bit more yeah. that intuitively my body is giving me signals to switch it up because we know yeah. students do that. We just, yeah. that, but there's a sort of like, sir, can I go to the bathroom <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for, for the third time? Right. So yeah. good indicator to switch it up. Yeah. Do you have time for a couple more? Of course. Okay. So the, um, I throw your name into Google mm-hmm. and in it, a whole bunch of stuff pops up and I mean, sketch notes is in there. Um, the SAMR model, Twitter, um, growth mindset, uh, one of the images that, uh, you had recreated about the iceberg, yeah. but I'm always fascinated about it. sort of like the ungoogleable question mm. and, and there's more, 
we use it often in in you know in, in classroom parlance to say, are you doing the right research? You know, are are you sort of approaching it the right way? Is it the mm-hmm. right inquire inquiry that you're doing? And if if Google can answer it easily, then it's not necessarily it, it can be it can maybe valuable, but it, you you want to ask questions, critical questions around yeah. that. Yeah. So. I, I sort of had this concept in my mind about the ungoogleable Sylvia, mm. and you, you went there, mm-hmm. as sort of a little bit about the phys ed, mm-hmm. um, but I guess the, I guess, what I'm interested in is the, the stuff that fuels what comes out in the classroom, mm-hmm. and you mentioned the marathons, um, and it speaks a little bit to sort of life balance and and well being. What's the stuff that you chase after to sort of stay? Stay that that version of you that now I'll tell you, like, there's a whole lot of people that sort of, they see you as something, right? Like, you know, my friend, you're going to Moscow. Someone noticed. Right. So how, how are you sort of feeding that, uh, how are you feeding that positive mindset? Um, okay, so uh, I have, I, I've got this really big thing about creativity. Uh-huh. And so I love experimenting with new tools and seeing what I can create out of them. And I share that passion with my students. So my, my, I've sort of turned my classroom into a project based classroom where Mm -hmm. they don't necessarily get to pick entirely what they're going to do their projects on. I'll give them a framework, but they do project after project after project after project. And and because they're creating things, they're creating videos, they're creating music, they're creating sketch notes, they're creating, 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 creating. And um, that's what keeps me passionate and alive is, is that whole notion that creativity can make someone really happy and provide them with a sense of accomplishment. And, and then sharing it on top of that makes it mm-hmm. even better. Um, so... Does that answer your question, Chris? I, no. I see that you have another note here on your fabulous sketch note, by the way. For you listeners, Chris uh, did this wonderful sketch note for me, putting together various things that he found on my website, I gather, and from Google. And one of the things he has is feeding the good wolf. So, Chris, I need to ask you what that means. I don't know what that means. There's a parable. There's a parable, and it's it stuck with me for a long, long time. There's a podcast as well called the one you feed and it's the parable um it's it's uh it may it may be indigenous american first people i i don't know exact origin um grandfather and grandchild grandfather is relating a story to grandchild about in in our lives in this world in ourselves in our spirit there are two wolves there's a, a good wolf or sometimes a, a, a white wolf and there, and there's a bad wolf sometimes considered to be a, a dark or okay. a dark wolf. Yeah. And the, they're in constant battle. They're in constant battle. The, the good wolf representing all the good qualities of the human spirit mm. and human action and the dark wolf representing the darker ones. Right. And the grand, grandchild after this explanation says, well, grandfather, um, which one wins? Mm-hmm. And the, and the grandfather says to the grandchild, the one you feed. Mm. So there's a whole lot. And I, and I only, I, I, I tiptoe on this because like I said, this podcast and there's a whole lot of other people that would do it far more justice. But I, mm. I do consider that idea of the feeding the good wolf. And, and the fact is you never fully get to starve out the bad wolf, but how mm. do you keep it in balance? Right. Not to say that mm. teaching is the dark wolf, <laughs> mm-hmm. but but feeding the good wolf, that's what it's, it kind of just, it sparked when I thought about the ungoogleable questions about Sylvia. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm, I'm understanding now. So it's what, what goes on that in the private, in the life of private Sylvia that, that allows me to be creative and, yeah. and to enjoy I think you, you said it though. You did say it because yeah. part of that, when I mentioned before about looking at your sketch notes, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know if, I don't know if, I think it'd be way, way too 
simple of me to somehow suggest that those are just things that you're entirely doing for other people. Mm -hmm. I think you'd like to do it. Oh, I love I, I think you, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think you, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen in different forums you answering about the stylus that you love to use. Yeah. And and you do it quite openly saying, this is the one, like, try it. You're going to love it, right? And and these people ask you questions about pursuing something that becomes their passion. Yeah. That That is already so obviously yours. Yeah. So I think the creativity part. It's a no, great way to frame that. It's it's so interesting because last year at ISTE, um, so in 2016, I did an impromptu sketch noting session in the Bloggers Cafe, and mm -hmm. one of the teachers was sitting there. Her name was Wanda Terrell. Do you know Wanda? Have not have not met digitally or or in real life yet. Okay, so you'll have to Google her. Um, okay. Terrell, that's T-E-R-R-E-L-L. -L. And she was sitting in the audience. She said, she came up to me before and she says, so just to let you know, I can't draw. Like I'm the worst at drawing ever. I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I've heard that before. So, so I showed her, I showed the group there. There's about 30 teachers how to use this app called Procreate app on the iPad, how to draw with it. And there's certain features about it that make it really easy to draw. So, um, I, I like I show them some tips and tricks and then Wanda I've kept in close touch with her on social media anyway it's turned out that she has become a sketch note fanatic and, and a sketch note uh, you know um, what do you call it a, a huge promoter of sketch noting and she's become mm -hmm. really really good at it to the point where the last ISTE she ran an impromptu session in the bloggers cafe on how to sketch note and i was in the audience and she's teaching awesome. me things about sketch noting that i didn't know so i had to i said to her after wanda do you realize what you just did like <laughs> last year this time you were in the audience going sylvia can't draw and now you're conducting a sketch noting session we both laughed and she said yeah it's it's pretty amazing the journey i've, I've taken so for those of you out there who say you can't sketch note you got to give it a try. It's really not that hard. Yeah. And it's funny. It's, it's, it's a dangerous, um, it's a dangerous pursuit only in so much as all of a sudden, you know, your collection of pens, they're just not the right pens or, you know, that pencil, uh, you know what, it doesn't hold the sharp point. Like, so there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's an easy access point, but I think like anything that connects with a passion, yeah. all of a sudden you start to notice, oh, this marker is better than this other marker. Right. Or <laughs> I love, I love dot paper better than plain paper. Right? Now, have you had a chance to interview Royan Lee? I had the pleasure of talking to Royan back in maybe February. Yeah. And I think it was, it was before the, it was before he he sort of uh, snapped off the uh, was it the doodle a day doodle a day thing yeah. yeah yeah I got I got to have a sit down with him so I do know him fantastic fantastic yeah. guy yeah he does amazing work with his students on sketch noting but I based my ISTE ignite talk on the doodle a day challenge that he started and also on another challenge on Twitter started by a group of American educators called Sketch Fifty. Mm -hmm. And so the the premise of my ISTE talk was that with with these Twitter challenges, it kind of created a sketch noting revolution. My talk was called the Sketch Noting Revolution, where where teachers and students from all around the world, at all age levels and every subject area, they were discovering doodling and sketch noting and the power of it. Mm -hmm. So um, Roy and Lee is is also uh, is, is become one of my mentors so far far as. Um, bringing it to students and like his students are doing phenomenal stuff with sketch notes. That's cool. I like that we have that connection because um, the conversation was in, in the podcast I did with him. We existed a little bit more in a space because again, that I knew of, I knew a little bit of his, let's say his creative side, but I was coming to him and we were talking about a little bit about social media use. Mm -hmm. So, and respect, respecting your audience and being aware of the relationship and planning towards that in real life meeting with every post. Yeah. And we had a phenomenal conversation. And then dude drops that 
like global classroom activity Mm -hmm. and i thought wow we didn't even i didn't even know that was part of his uh you know his his toolkit and it it was it was cool yeah no it was a great initiative so that doodle a day challenge produced more than six thousand tweets over the course of the month and then the sketch 50 challenge produced more than thirty thousand tweets so it was a, a hands down phenomenal success it was like a short run mooc like one of those online right <laughs> because and the other thing too is there was a lot of skill sets being there was there was there was a lot of sidebar in that i tried to do the sketch 50 i was just fatigued i yeah. made it i made it through every single one for the royan and like yeah i'm totally gonna do the sketch 50 i'm like yeah. it's too much ice cream i just i have oh, to for sure. yeah i but, tried you know, it's funny because royan's prompts were quite different from the sketch 50 prompts so royan's yes. royan's prompts were designed to be fun and thought-provoking like Doodle your inner critic or um, doodle the concept love but without hearts and without the color red or um, make a stain with a drink and turn it into a doodle. Um, So, you know, things like that. Whereas the Sketch 50 was more like draw a light bulb, draw Mm -hmm. helping hands, draw two people talking. And so I think they, they serve different purposes, but the Sketch 50 challenge was more get out there, start doodling, and build your visual vocabulary so that when it comes to doing sketch notes, you have the, you've gone through the process of how do you draw a light bulb, how do you draw helping hands, how do you draw two people talking. So I think that was the purpose of Sketch 50. It sort of had a different purpose to it. I think what was cool in that was the individuals that did Royans and then yeah. right away jumped on board because I think there might was even some overlap there was there overlap or was it month oh, to yeah. month back to back but the individuals that I had sort of been drawing with with mm-hmm. um do Day, mm-hmm. they weren't drawing just the light bulb stuff I did right. notice that I was like they're already ramped up they're on their like 2.0 sketch noter oh, <laughs> they bought goodness. they bought the markers like they were actually you sort of look at some of the individuals like oh I've never done sketch noting before so I'm going to give this a try and they and they yeah. cover the prompt and then some of the yeah. individuals I'm not like okay that's like a three dimensional light bulb that has oh, like words floating like I they were know. sort of <laughs> I loved they're, it I was like and existing in the same really- classroom. Yeah, the creativity was mind-boggling of mm-hmm. those duos that came out. It was, it was fantastic. So I want to respect the time. You've been very gracious. So I'll give you I, I the, the whole chasing squirrels thing. I'll just throw it down. It's just quick. My dog grabbed a squirrel off a tree one day. So there's a real back, back, back story. And it stuck with me because it strikes me still to this day as an impossible thing to do. You know, you go run up to a squirrel, it counter circulates, gets up to the branch and just chirps at you. My dog somehow intuitively went around, caught the squirrel, pulled it off the tree. No harm came to either animal, but I couldn't help but think, and I think why the story sticks with me, one, because that's kind of what my teacher brain does, Mm -hmm. but it still fascinates me because um, neither one of them knew what to do when they actually (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure that was a paradigm shift for the squirrel. Like, well, this is different. I just got caught off a tree. And my dog didn't know what to do. It just kind of held it there. And then the squirrel went off and left. So somehow when I thought about doing this podcast, part of it was not only meeting and, and getting to know um, educators beyond the 140 characters. Yeah. It was also kind of getting to that. What What is it that you're kind of working on or working towards? Yeah. Um, you know, I could make it, you know, really dress down and say, what is it that you're, you're chasing, so to speak? Yeah. And, and you have a, an incredible kind of checkpoint. And I'm going to say in your educator's career right now. Yeah. Because you just told me recently, like today, mm-hmm. that you are now in the process. I'm going to call it the process because I've spoken to others. The process of retirement. Yeah. I love so, your sketch note, by the way. It's just with- <laughs> tires that was really funny well i'll owe that i actually i'll give i'll give credit to where credit is due that comes from stephen hurley and when oh. he he talks specifically about being retired as in a, not a starting point but sort of putting on that next set of you know wherever the journey is going to take you next so i really love that i love I will, that yeah. so with this being the next mm-hmm. possibility any Care to drop any ideas on what's the next? Yeah. Well, I what I'm really looking forward to is 
going to more conferences and it's, <laughs> it's really nice now that when people ask me to a conference I can go yeah I'm coming like when do you want me to come and oh it's in Russia no problem like I don't have to ask my admin for time off which is really nice um, that's that was really tough going to conferences and getting time off work yep. um, but I'm also I've, I've started a project with Holly Clark who's from the EdTech Team Press and we're creating an online course for sketchnoting so it's going to be a video course where teachers can turn it on and, and work on it with their students. There's a bunch of videos, scaffolding, different lessons for sketchnoting. And um, we've started it. I, this is my project this summer to work on it. We're hoping to launch it in the fall. So that's my, that's my big project I'm working on right now. And the, one of the really exciting things about this course is that it also comes with a database so that if you're wondering how to draw courage, for example, you can type in the oh, word courage and then the awesome. sketchnoting icon will come up. It's kind of like the, you know, the noun project. With yes. The, so it's kind of like that, but for sketchnoting icons. So that, That's cool. Yeah. So that's what I've been working on. Um, so that and, and going to more conferences is, uh, oh, and visiting my daughter. She lives in Australia. She lives in Melbourne. She teaches in Melbourne, so I'm going to be visiting her in a couple of weeks. So I don't have to, you know, so I'm visiting her in September, so I, I don't have to hurry back and get back to my class. I can um, travel on the uh, less busy time so I can get better rates for traveling. My husband and I, we just moved downtown. We downsized. We bought, we sold our house in sort of North Toronto. We have bought a condo downtown. We're enjoying the downtown life, we live two blocks away from St. Lawrence Market. I go there every day and I pick up some fresh food and then we cook it at night. I've joined the Y, which is the Cherry Beach Y, which is fantastic. I try to go there every day. Um, I'm really enjoying this this place in my life. It's a great spot to be. Chris, when do you do for retirement? Oh, <laughs> I, love, I love it. Um, not for a while, Sylvia. Um, <laughs> I'm, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I, I don't go ahead. No, I was, you didn't get a chance to answer your, my question. Go ahead. Well, it's just it, no, no, it's 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 funny. Um, the conversation comes up a lot. So both both my spouse and I are teachers. Um, she teaches drama and English at a high school in Vaughan, and I'm I'm at a high school in uh, in Newmarket. Mm -hmm. And she very much like she knows the days. Like she's she's counting. Yeah. I'm. Uh, this is my second career, so I've been teaching for. I'm going into my 13th year of teaching. Prior to that, I was a chef. I had been in hospitality for since I was 13 years old. So, right now, I I turn 40. What is it? 2017. I turn 46 this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm retirement conceptually is not something that I'm comfortable with. Like, I just yeah. don't have an idea of what that looks like. Numerically, it's still a little ways off. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I was not one of those teachers who would look be looking at the clock either, like the countdown. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of snuck up on me. And I was getting these notices from the Ontario Teachers Pension <laughs> Board, like, you know, you can retire, you can retire. I could have retired yeah. April 1st. And I kept on putting it aside. And finally... Um, I think it was when I was I was visiting my daughter over the March break, and it was yep. I, I really hated leaving her. It was, we had such a nice nice time, and it just occurred to me like why why wouldn't I retire? Like I hit the eighty five factor, so yep. uh, we are so lucky to have that in Ontario. And for you listeners who don't know what that is, um, when your years teaching combined with your age add up to eighty five, you can retire on full pension, um, and so that that point hit hit my uh, hit my career and I looked at the numbers I financially we just sold our house you know we bought a smaller condo everything kind of fit into into place and so um, I I talked to my husband and he said yeah go for it and so here I am I'm I'm on this new chapter of my life I love I love that the universe the universe and as you said the the rules and regulations you know you you got the message you know, mm -hmm. you know, saying goodbye to your daughter sounds like it was a pretty powerful <laughs> message. Like, yeah, I think I think I could do this, and then the numbers align, it, and you're like, so be it. Going to move yeah. forward with it. it really, I'm not getting any just, of those messages yet. <laughs> is, no, it seemed like it was just meant to be. The timing was perfect. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really great, my friend. Um, I think that was wonderful. 
Okay. Um, where where would you like to be found in this? Like I said, in this in this next stage, if people are reaching out, people want to connect with you, ask questions, see your work. Where would you like to be sure. found? So sylviaduckworth.com is my my blog slash website. All my resources are there. Um, there's links to how you can email me. Um, I've got links to my sketch notebook on how to buy it. Where you can find me, upcoming conferences. There's a page there for upcoming conferences. Uh, a bunch of other sites that I have going. So, yeah, please, uh, I love to hear from you. Please follow me on Twitter, Sylvia Duckworth. It's at Sylvia Duckworth, just the way it sounds. And uh, I look forward to meeting some of you listeners if I haven't met you already. And thanks for having me, Chris. It's been fun. Absolutely. Thank you for giving me your time. And uh, I wish you the, the best of enjoyment in the next steps. And by all means, I look forward to however they capture the the video or the audio or whatever transcript comes out of your your trip to Moscow. That's a mm-hmm. that's a phenomenally exciting um, next step. I, I would yeah. never get tired of saying that. <laughs> I'm going to Mo- I'm going to Moscow. I'm going to Moscow. Right. People are like I'm, what? I'm taking, like I'm taking a day off to visit a Moscow elementary school as well. So I'm curious oh. to see how their education awesome. differs from ours. Yeah, and then I'll be taking a day off to tour Moscow to do the tourist thing. So I'll be taking lots of pictures and tweeting them out, sharing them out for sure. I follow willingly. I look forward to the posts. Okay, thank you, Chris. Fantastic. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye. Nice chatting. Chasing Squirrels podcast can be found on Podbean and iTunes. If you want to have a conversation on the podcast, please reach out to me. Probably the best way to connect with me is on Twitter. So that would be at Chris J. Clough. I also blog a little bit on WordPress. Feel free to check in on some of those topics. And I really do appreciate the time you spent with the podcast. Thank you for listening and have a fantastic evening.